Hello and welcome to the Out and Out Trader, where we cover everything you need to know about the markets this week. In this week's narrative versus reality, we take a deep dive into inflation figures following the 7.5% print that we saw on Thursday. After a deeper look at the numbers, it appears that all is not what it seems. In news to watch, we'll keep a close eye on economic news coming out of China as the Chinese New Year celebrations draw to an end. Highlights of the economic calendar this week include the FOMC's meeting minutes, which will give some clues as to what the Fed's reaction to the current inflation environment will be. And we'll finish off with our trade of the week, which is a short trade in the Swiss franc against the Japanese yen. Let's get into it. So this week we saw some wild swings in the market as the consumer price index climbed 7.5% from a year earlier. We'd already seen a 7% annual gain in December, reflecting broad price increases that included higher food, electricity and shelter costs across the, glo or across the American economy as well as the global economy. The economists had projected a 7.3% year-on-year increase and the upside surprise obviously led to some volatile moves across all areas of the market. The dollar reinforces the Fed's intentions to begin raising rates next month Month and to combat that broad-based inflationary pressure, we may even be seeing a 0.5% increase um, against the 0.25% increase that the markets have been um, generally looking for. So we may see the Fed accelerate their tightening program, start to accelerate the interest rate increases, um, and really just get more aggressive with the inflationary battle that they have at the moment. But in narrative versus reality this week, we want to break down some of these figures and just show you how there may just be a little bit of room for some policy error that the Fed is about to make, and which will obviously lead some to some great opportunities in the markets. So first of all, looking at oil versus inflation. And oil is going to be the main driver versus inflation in any instance because high oil prices always leads to higher transport costs and higher transport costs always get passed, passed on to the consumer, um, which obviously leads to inflation and price increases. And we can see here how consumer price index uh, and WTI tend to track each other pretty well. And if you look closely, you can see how whenever we see an upside swing in oil, a couple of months later, we often see a swing to the upside in consumer price in the consumer price index and obviously when we see a peak in oil and things start to roll over a few months later you start to see inflation rolling over we saw the same thing in 2000 we saw it in 2008 we saw the upswing in 2009 we saw uh, the same thing in 2020 as oil prices started to really rally strongly following covid and the supply chain issues we started to see inflation really start to rally strongly um, but what we've seen in the year-on-year -year changes since kind of October, November last year, we've seen a peak in those year-on-year -year changes in oil and quite a big dip since then. Uh, and obviously, if we look at the expectations of what inflation is saying, everyone's saying that inflation is going to continue hard and strong moving forward. But if this chart is anything to go by, then we know what we're looking at is a potential peak in inflation over the next few months and inflation rolling over as the Fed is starting to cut uh, increase interest rates. So we're going to potentially see some policy errors here. And those policy errors are going to lead to some great opportunities in the market, as we said. Same thing is occurring in the gas market. Obviously, uh, gas and petrol is a massive driver of costs and inflation in the US. You can see how well this chart tracks uh, or how well inflation tracks gas prices in this instance. And when we take a look at what's happened over the last few months, we saw a peak early in 2021 in May. Then we kind of saw a double top again back in October, November, and that's rolled over pretty strongly since then um, while inflation has continued to climb. It looks like only a matter of time until inflation rolls over uh, to follow these gas prices down. And then moving forward into durable goods, which for the others of you that don't know, these are kind of the goods that last longer than three years. They're consumer goods that are kind of uh, not occurring every week, but more to do with kind of bigger purchases like your fridges, your TVs, your microwaves, things like that. They last at least three years and a good indication of kind of what the economy is doing because if people are buying a lot of durable goods, it means there's a lot of money in the system, uh, a lot of cash in the economy and lots of um, expenditure or lots of room to spend money for the consumer. What we're seeing in new orders of durable goods uh, is a rolling over again 
from kind of October, November last year. And again, when we look at the tracking of the inflation figures with manufacturing new orders of durable goods, you can see how we're seeing this massive disparity between those order of goods and the inflation figures. And a lot of people will look at this and think, yeah, well, that's because we have supply chain shortages. And so supply chain shortages that are causing problems. Um, but when we go over to inventories, you can see how basically all the way through 2022 or 2020 and into early 2021, we had those supply chain shortages, which led to a decrease in the total inventories being held by manufacturers. But since kind of January 2021, as those bottlenecks started to be relieved, uh, inventories started to climb quite strongly. Um, and we were already going beyond the 2020 uh, or pre-COVID trend um, going above those inventory levels. So we're seeing already how the inventories have bounced back, but the consumer is not there anymore to kind of take up those inventories. And when we look at freight costs, we see how freight costs peaked in September 2021 at around about 11,000. Obviously, they're still way higher than they were back in 2020 or pre-COVID. However, they have rolled over from the peak. And interestingly enough, oil was sitting at around about $74 uh, on the 10th of September. Oil since then has climbed all the way up to around about $95. Uh, and yet we've seen uh, freight costs start to slowly roll over. So if we start to see, um, and I believe that's an instance of the demand for freight costs dropping off as oil prices climb too high. And as demand drops off, the price um, drops off in freight costs. And that obviously starts to drive down inflation because freight costs are the massive part of the pricing of goods. So if we continue to see this change in oil, rollover we continue to see the change in freight rollover then we will continue to see the inflation rollover or we'll begin to see inflation rollover um, which will be a massive kind of uh, pain in the neck for the FOMC if they are looking at raising rates so quickly so strongly when we look at the Baltic dry index which is basically the transportation of dry goods such as your grains um, iron ore things along those lines we can see how those peaked back in October and have basically been in free fall coming all the way back to kind of July 2021 figures and even pre-COVID levels are pretty close to this level so dry bulk index we're seeing massive decreases in prices there and obviously, prices we are experiencing now are a result of previous high transport costs because as transport costs occur here, things are getting sold still for the next few months at these October levels. Um, and as the new prices come in, they'll come in lower or be able to come in lower because the cost of transportation was lower as goods come to the market. And same thing with uh, containers. Obviously, we had a massive buildup of containers in uh, the LA port, which was causing massive bottlenecks in the supply chain, which was obviously pushing up costs. But what we've seen basically since October is a massive decrease in the number of containers, especially ones taking nine days plus to, to process, um, which are down 76%. So the processing speed of containers is going up strongly. The number of containers uh, as a whole is coming down, which is actually showing you how there's a either those supply chain bottlenecks are being sorted out or we're actually starting to see a lack of demand as the containers stop flowing through. Uh, but either way, we're seeing the containers normalize and the, with the normalization, we're seeing the supply chain bottlenecks getting wrapped up and with that we'll start to see a decrease in price um, moving forward and then finally we have five-year forward inflation expectation rate um, what we saw was that peaking in first in april and then once again in september october very similar to the gas prices where we saw that double top and that's rolled over and even with the print that we saw on thursday at 7.5 percent inflation the expectation of five-year forwards remains at 2.5 percent or 2.05 percent excuse me and we expect this to continue to roll over as gas prices roll over, as potentially oil rolls over, and as the demand for goods with such a high oil price, with such high f prices as a result of the um, supply chain inflation, 
and potentially what they were calling the money printing inflation, which I don't believe uh, is actually the case. I do believe we're going to see inflation roll over here, which provides some interesting opportunities in the markets, especially in something like gold as real rates start to rise as a result of a decrease in inflation. Gold is going to take a massive hit, especially with so many people um, touting gold at the moment. Gold bugs in love with the inflation figures at the moment because inflation is supposed to drive gold higher. But if that rolls over, I think we'll start to see gold roll over. I think the last to roll over will be oil, but there'll be some great opportunities there because we're looking at a global economic slowdown moving forward. And if you really want to look at what we're seeing in the charts at the moment, just take a look at 2011. Basically, between 2008 and 2011, when expectations in inflation were really high, what we saw was commodities being driven higher by those expectations. It wasn't anything really to do with a demand in the economy or a long-lasting demand in the economy, which most commodity traders will want to call the commodity super cycle. Same thing this time. We're not seeing the start of the commodity super cycle now. We're just seeing a very similar situation that we saw in 2008 to 2011. And what happened in 2011 was the European debt crisis, which led to a massive demand shock. No demand for commodities, no demand for goods as the kind of global economy um, went into another slowdown. And then we started to see commodities roll over. And that's exactly what we expect moving forward. I think we've already seen the highs in something like copper. We've seen the highs in gold. Back in August last year, highs in silver, all the commodities basically. Oil is the only one driving up now, but that is often the last thing to roll over as the economy rolls over and demand for oil rolls over. And then we're going to start to see um, that economic slowdown come into play. So we'll be keeping a close eye on that. And as we mentioned in the news, we'll be keeping a close eye on China. In the news to watch this week, we'll be keeping a close eye on China as the economy comes back to life following their New Year's celebrations. Uh, already see CNBC reporting that China's holiday box office plunged by 23% as theaters push prices to record highs. So the seven-day lunar New Year holiday that ended Sunday is typically the biggest week for the year for the new movie release in China, but the total holiday box office dropped by 23% versus last year, while ticket prices rose by 8%. So we're seeing how the consumer is just unable to take on higher prices at the economic conditions following the Chinese financial crisis or the Chinese property crisis that's unfolding at the moment. So the slump comes amid sluggish consumer spending in China and may be a sign of the current economic conditions in China as the property crisis continues to unfold. Then we saw Bloomberg reporting that Chinese state funds have been propping up the stock market. Obviously, that's not a good sign for stocks and for the market in general if state funds are required in order to prop up the market and keep it from falling further. We saw the Shanghai high composite index remained 25% off of its 2021 highs, while the China A50, which is China's tech sector, remains 26% of its highs or from its pre-crackdown highs. Obviously, we saw some big crackdowns in the tech sector by Chinese authorities, um, and the prices have yet to recover from there. We remain hopeful and fairly bullish on Chinese tech um, after a little bit more downside, as you can see from the chart. But... Uh, Longer term, we do remain China bulls in the tech sector, and that's probably got to do with Chinese uh, interest rate cuts and huge stimulus moving forward, kind of like Apple and the FANG stocks in the US, which run very well under these low interest rate conditions because their discounted cash flow numbers go through the roof. So we'll be watching Chinese tech moving forward. There will be a good time to buy. But right now, we remain on the sidelines. And then finally, Chinese news reports that bond sales from cash-strapped Chinese real estate developers plunged 70% last month and become harder for Chinese developers to find international investors willing to buy their debt following a series of defaults. And while many have been downgraded to junk status by international credit agencies, so very much showing us that the Chinese property crisis is still well underway uh, and it will begin to roll into the Chinese economy and the Chinese, uh, the broader Chinese economy in general as we've been seeing in those theater ticket prices or cinema ticket prices following one of the biggest and most important um, holidays uh, for the movie industry in China, which is the biggest movie industry in the world. So we're just seeing a lot of news out of China already, and we'll continue to watch for that news coming this week for the Chinese economy to continue to slow down moving forward. 
fairly quiet on the economic calendar this week. On Tuesday, we have Japanese GDP figures and the Reserve Bank of Australia's meeting minutes. So we'll be keeping a close eye on those for potential further rate hikes in Australia moving forward. We have UK unemployment and EU GDP as well. And then on Wednesday, we have China CPI and PPI. PPI is an important one for us because if PPI continues to roll over, as we suspect it is, then we can continue to see inflation roll over to the rest of the world because if Chinese products start to become cheaper as well as the cost of transporting those costs moving forward comes cheaper then we will begin to see inflation rolling over across the globe as well as in the US. We'll be watching those PPI figures pretty closely. We also have UK CPI figures coming out. Uh, we have US retail sales. We'll be watching that. If, you, if retail sales come out lower than expected we'll begin to see how inflation is starting to press on the consumer and that may be causing an economic slowdown moving forward. What that means for the effort FOMC will yet to find, but FOMC seems to be painting itself into a corner as the economic slowdown in the U.S. continues, but inflation continues to rise. The FOMC is under increasing pressure to raise rates into a weakening economy, which is going to be bad news for the U.S. economy moving forward. Then we also have Canada CPI figures and the FOMC meeting minutes, which will be kind of fine tooth combed through by investors to see what the uh, strategy for the FMC is moving forward. Um, obviously, obviously, the FMC was said to have met this weekend with the potential for emergency interest rate hikes. So we'll be watching for some news of that moving forward, but it doesn't appear to be the case from what I've seen on the news wires. And finally, we'll be taking a closer look at our trade of the week, which is the Swiss franc short against the Japanese yen. So taking a look at the monthly chart all the way out to the monthlies, we see a really nice clean structure developing here where we have our impulse up and we've developed into a fairly decent looking corrective structure. We're in the midst of a fairly decent corrective structure um, which should see the very least another move to the downside developing along these lines somewhere in this region. Whether we're going to climb up higher from here or fall from this region where we are now, that leads to a pretty big move on the higher time frames. Um, and when we look at what we've seen in this B wave section, so this is obviously for those that don't know the B wave section of this correction, we have seen some good complexity and we've seen price climb pretty high following um, the initial move. So if you guys have seen our video in terms of price structures, we know we have this impulse up, we go into a correction and we have another impulse up and then following that we either have another correction or a fall. In this instance, because of the structure on the higher time frames, we're expecting a fall somewhere from this region um, in quite a large magnitude to the downside. So we're watching for that turnaround. And when we go into the lower time frames, Okay, the eight hour chart, we can see some pretty interesting price action that's developed. Um, we've had a really nice move off the highs, very impulsive price wave off those highs and developed into what we call a expanding flat corrective structure. And as we mentioned, every corrective structure follows was followed by an impulse to the downside. So we're keeping a close eye on this for potential trade somewhere in this region. Um, it'll be a short trade, so we're looking to short the Swiss yen versus uh, the, or short the Swiss franc, excuse me, versus the yen, and we'll be looking for, at the very least, some price action to get down towards this 122.75 level. And, but why we like this trade so much is because of that higher time frame confirmation that if we do see a turn in price here, we may see this short term trade actually develop into something much longer and we're just getting into it at a very early level. So watching this price action unfold, watching the structures unfold here provides us a great opportunity to get into a potential short trade. On the hourly chart, we don't have much following the price action we saw heading into the close on Friday, obviously very, very wild price swings following a massive dip in price from kind of 125.20 all the way down to 124.30 which is a very very big move for a couple of hours and then we saw a really strong bounce back heading into the close so we can see some price action develop in here which gives us an opportunity to get into the trade higher up and then just choke down our stop loss uh, to give us a better risk reward on the trade then we can see how this trade just becomes even more attractive so that's why we'll be keeping a close eye on this one being very patient about this one and hopefully getting a really good kind of at least two to one out of the risk of the trade and potentially 
taking our profit target even further down if price action continues to show us a downward trend has occurred or change in the higher time frame trend has occurred. So we'll be keeping a close eye on the Swiss yen this week and a potential short trade there. Some other charts we'll be keeping a close eye on. Obviously, the dollar, taking a close eye on what the dollar's been doing. If we take a look at the euro, uh, if you guys remember from a couple of episodes back, we mentioned there's a potential bounce available here in the euro, which could get us all the way up to kind of 116.60. From our price measures, this structure has already done enough, having got into this 115 level. If we continue to fall down from this 115 level, then we may have seen a turn in the US dollar um, that may not turn around from here. We may have seen peak euro US dollar and peak US dollar across the board as we continue to fall to the downside. As you guys know, in the longer term, we believe the euro is going below parity, going sub one um, over the next kind of probably a year, maybe two years. But when we look at the lower time frames, we are seeing signs that we may have seen that turn already. And that counter trend rally is now over and we'll definitely be looking for short entries. There was a little bit of a flag entry available to our members um, heading into the close on Friday. That has since moved pretty strongly um, from there, but we can still look for a corrective structure in this region and start to look for that Euro US dollar short somewhere in here. Um, to carry that over a longer term kind of swing trade moving forward. So I'll be watching for the euro US dollar to go and break the lows. And if we get that price action that resembles that we have actually seen the turn and that that counter rally is over and that we saw a peak at 115 or 114.85 in the euro, then we know that the US dollar bull market is underway. And be also keeping a close eye on silver and gold because obviously if inflation figures start to roll over then silver and gold are going to come under pressure i believe what we've seen here is probably peak gold prices um following what we're looking at in the structure i think we're seeing peak gold prices it's either an a b c d e corrective structure that's going to see the next move look like that or it is just the middle of a more complex corrective structure where we'll have a move down towards 1650, then one last pop higher, and then we will see this drop for the next leg down in gold. But I don't think that is actually the case. I actually start, so I'm actually starting to think that what we're looking at here is just a bigger expanding or bigger contracting triangle, A, B, C, D, E. This E wave is now done or should be done this week. And then we're going to see the next move down in gold head down towards that 1500 level. And ultimately, I believe we're going to see gold down to 1250 before we see the turn to the upside. So that's a price action I'm looking for. And if that happens in gold, I'm looking to short silver still um, as silver should be going sub 10 moving forward especially infl if inflation figures continue to roll over i think with stubborn silver or silver has been really stubborn in this region especially at this kind of 22 dollar region once this 22 to 2150 region drops we're going to see um, silver plummet basically all the way down to 18 in a matter of days so we're watching for that if we're looking for silver to start to drop from this level it needs to start moving pretty early in the week so we'll be watching for that um, looking for a little bit of a double top if we look at the macd on the lower time frames you're seeing we've already got some divergence here so if this starts to drop we'll be watching for a potential short in silver so members we'll see you in the members area tomorrow for our weekly game plan we'll be breaking down all the trades we'll be having on our radar this week investor guidance members will look out for some new equities that we'll be adding to the list this week if you're not a member in any of those areas take a look at the website below our investor guidance service launched in november we've already seen a 20 percent increase in our equities that we recommended uh, in november as we decided that energy would be a great place to park some money over the next few months um, so that's performed really well there's some really good looking stocks on our radar beyond just the u.s markets we're looking at south african markets we're looking at australian markets we'll be looking at Canadian markets moving forward and we will be happy to add any markets if the demand for those markets is there from our members so if you are not a member of investor guidance join us there if you're looking to trade these markets uh, on a more shorter term basis you're looking to trade currencies commodities and even crypto join us in the 
Trading Academy where we'll teach you everything we know about trading and break down the markets on a daily basis to show you what trades you should be looking at uh, and where your money should be parked over the coming days. So cool guys, hope you have a great week. Thanks for watching and we will see you again soon.